So we are standing at the back of the chapel of St Mary Undercroft, at, uh, in the heart of Parliament near Westminster Hall, at the site of one of the most famous and interesting uh, sites with regard to suffragette demonstrations in the Palace of Westminster in the early 20th century, because we are at the Emily Wilding Davison cupboard, which is the door behind me just here. So on census night, on the 2nd of April 1911, the suffragette Emily Wilding Davison hid overnight in this cupboard um, in the House of Commons so that she could say on her census form the following morning that she was resident in the Palace of Westminster and therefore make claim to the same political rights as men. Now, Emily Wilding Davison is best known today as a suffragette martyr. She died following an incident with the King's Horse at the Epsom Derby in 1913 and became you know, incredibly famous from that point on. But well before that, she was campaigning all over, all over London, all over the country, but um, many times here. We have police reports in the parliamentary archives which show her hiding here, campaigning here, throwing stones, breaking windows, being found on a staircase in the middle of the night um, here in the Palace of Westminster. So she must have known the building, I think, pretty well by the time she came to hide here in 1911. And um, the census was a... a the census was a target of protest by many suffragettes. Some chose to evade the census and they went out all night, spent the night uh, skating on ice rinks, that kind of thing. Some hid, or refused to be counted. Others chose to deface their census forms um, and some complied, feeling that they ought to do it and this would show they were good citizens who deserved the vote. But Emily Wilding Davison always liked to be a bit different. She was a rebel, she didn't toe the party line. She was a member of the Women's Social and Political Union, the Pankhurst Suffragette Organisation, but she didn't always do um, what they did or agreed with what they did. And so her census protest was very much her acting on her own. So she arrived at the Palace of Westminster the night before the census. Uh, she joined a tour that was going through and then she just peeled off from the tour and made her way to this cupboard and hid it overnight. And uh, of course it would have been dark, it would have been lonely, it would have been cold. She, would have, she may have brought some provisions with her but uh, no food, drink or any other facilities nearby. Um, it must have been really quite you know, frightening and tedious, possibly sort of waiting the night through. Um, but, and then she was found the following morning um, by a cleaner and uh, uh, her presence was immediately uh, made known in Parliament. It's mentioned in Hansard, the parliamentary debate for that day. And uh, the uh, authorities ordered that she be recorded on the census. Um, and so the clerk of works in the Palace of Westminster duly filled out the census form for her that night, which said she was found hiding in the crypt um, off Westminster Hall since Saturday. And she was also recorded at her home address by her landlady. So curiously, she's actually recorded twice on the 1911 census. So the cupboard, um, therefore, is significant for Emily Wilding Davison's protest. And in the 1990s, Tony Benn MP decided that um, it should be marked in some way. So he didn't ask permission. He just had a plaque made. He put the wording on it that he wanted to have on it. And then he just came here, uh, accompanied by Jeremy Corbyn MP, um, with a, a screwdriver, and uh, they just came down to the chapel in the middle of the night, rather like Emily Wilding Davison herself, without having sought permission, and they screwed the plaque up. Um, and you can still see it today on the inside of the cupboard door um, here in the Palace of Westminster. So we've now moved through from the chapel, through Westminster Hall, into St Stephen's Hall. And this was the scene of uh, many suffragette outrages in the Palace of Westminster in the early 20th century, including at this very statue here when on the 27th of April 1909, a suffragette from the Women's Social and Political Union called Marjorie Humes chained herself to the statue of Viscount Falkland here. Now, why were the suffragettes in St Stephen's Hall? The reason for that is because they were banned from Central Lobby, which is behind us there. So, 100 years ago, people who wanted to meet MPs, uh, come and see parliamentary proceedings, would walk through St Stephen's Hall and wait in Central Lobby for a ticket to go into the galleries, perhaps. But there were so many suffragette uh, outrages in Central Lobby uh, from 1906 onwards, including women who jumped on chairs and shouted votes for women, um, that it was decided that this was too disruptive for the running of Parliament and women would have to wait in St Stephen's Hall instead. But all this did was to move the agitation to St Stephen's Hall. And so many things happened here over the years, including a suffragette who, for example, stamped on one of the walls an extract from the Bill of Rights about the right to petition. 
but the most famous incident uh, happened here at this statue. So on this particular day, four suffragettes, um, not obviously suffragettes of course, came into the building and each of them sat solemnly by a statue by the four in this um, end of St Stephen's Hall here and Marjorie Hume sat next to Falkland. And at a particular moment, a pre-arranged signal, they all stood up, shouted votes for women and then they pulled chain belts out from under their clothes and each one of them chained themselves to a statue. And the authorities rushed in with bolt clippers to get the suffragettes off. And um, they managed to get the suffragettes off the other three fairly quickly, but Marjorie Hume they found a little bit more difficult. And so when they were getting her off, they damaged the spur on the boot of Falkland here. And so as you see it today, it is still damaged by the work of that bolt clipper as they cut her off. So the spur you see today is the same spur that was damaged by the bolt clipper that they used to cut Marjorie Humes off this statue. And I think it's a really great reminder as we walk through the hall of how the, the actions of women in history are all around us. We've now come through from St Stephen's Hall and we're standing in the central lobby in the heart of Parliament between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. There were many incidences of suffragette agitation in the early 20th century here. But we've stopped here so we can have a look at the grills covering the windows here. Now back in the days of the suffragette, the grills weren't here. The grills were screening the windows of the ladies' gallery. Because if you were a woman 100 years ago, and you wanted to come here to watch parliamentary debates. You couldn't sit with your husband, your father, your brother, anyone else you came uh, with who was a man. They sat in the strangers gallery, um, roughly where the public gallery is today. If you're a woman, you had to be separated from them and go and sit in a separate gallery, high above the speaker's chair, the ladies gallery. Now the ladies gallery was very hot, stuffy, smelly and very unpleasant place by all accounts to sit in. It was very difficult to hear, to see and the reason for that was these grills that covered the windows. And the grills were put there deliberately over the windows to stop the MPs um, seeing women watching them in case it distracted them. That is the reason. But um, because of this, the grills became um, a much hated feature of the ladies' gallery. Women asked for them to be removed repeatedly over the decades and were refused. And so they became both a physical and a metaphorical symbol of women's exclusion from Parliament and its proceedings. And so it was targeted by the suffragettes. On the 28th of October 1908, suffragettes from the Women's Freedom League made their way up to the ladies' gallery and sat there behind the grill. And at a particular point in the evening, they stood up and they shouted votes for women. Two of the women chained themselves to the grill and a third suffragette thrust the banner through the grill and lowered it down into the House of Commons chamber before. And there was uproar. There was enormous uproar. And if you read Hansard, the parliamentary debate for that evening, it said that Hansard reporter was unable to hear the rest of that speech because of the disturbance in the ladies gallery. So the two suffragettes who chained themselves to the grill were Muriel Matters and Helen Fox. And Muriel Matters was significant because she, she was Australian. Women had the vote in Australia by this point, but she had come to Britain to fight the suffragette cause with her British sisters. sisters. And uh, Muriel Matters was involved in all sorts of suffragette action as well as this one. But this one uh, here in the heart of Parliament was perhaps the most famous and significant. So she and Helen Fox chained themselves to the grill. The authorities rushed in to try and get the women off the grill. They could not immediately remove it. This was before they bought the bolt, cl bolt clippers. So they took the whole grill out of the window, frog marched the suffragettes out, still attached to the grill, took them to a committee room nearby and then sawed them off there. And, uh, and then the women were released. Um, and uh, the ladies' gallery remained closed for quite some time um, by order of the speaker after that. And the grills remained in the windows um, until uh, women, some women got the vote in 1918 and then it was deemed that they should be removed because times had changed and they were no longer necessary. But many people wished it to be remembered that uh, this is what they were and this is what they were used for. So they were put here in central lobby and a plaque was put here to tell everybody what they were.